Okay. Uh, I never know how to start these things. Um, so, hey, everybody. It's me and Aaron here, hoping more people show up. Uh, we're doing Chapter 2 of A Theory of Justice. This one's titled The Principles of Justice. And um, the first section is uh, Institutions and Formal Justice. Um, one thing from this section that I like um, was that he uh, talked about how um, abstract things can't really be just or unjust, but only realized things can be just or unjust. Um, so he seems to think that only things that um, have actually been uh, brought about can have those properties. Um, uh, the first sections are about uh, finally defining what institutions are and how they operate generally. Um, so he talks about um, uh, games and rituals, trials and parliaments, markets and systems of property. Um, and this is where he goes into um, that things can be thought of as abstract objects. Um, and also as uh, realized things. Um, and that's where he talks about uh, an institution as realized is um, the only thing that could be just or unjust. Yeah. Oh, I had a question. Uh, besides government institutions, did you think he he also sees businesses as institutions? Because he talks about free markets a bunch of times, and, but he also talks about how uh, uh, that... <laughs> the, everything that's operating in the free market like needs to be fair and just and just like he talks about the government parts. Yeah, that was something um, I really appreciated about this was that, um, I mean, he'll take four paragraphs to uh, break things down into pieces and explain them, like, really finely. Um, even, uh, it's in a later section, so we'll save it to there, but, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, which, I don't know, is that, uh, is that uh, a feature of Rawls? Does, do, other, um, do other writers take such care? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's good, yeah. Um, one thing he goes over um, in this section, um, uh, he, he calls the, the justice that pertains to institutions formal justice uh, or at least one part of it is called he would calls formal justice and he sort of defines this as adherence to principle um, consistency and regularity in the administration of institutions 
and the principles uh, must in themselves be just. Um, and this is something he um, he talks about later in the chapter um, that uh, one part of a just system um, is that it's regular and consistent and people can um, understand the rules. He also takes a, um, a bit to talk about um, if there were ever, um, I guess he's also taking from um, historical examples, but he says unjust societies are unlikely to hold to formal justice. Um, he thinks that um, if you're, perp if, uh, you're perpetuating um, injustice, um, that you are probably not holding to any particular principle, or at least um, you might not feel obligated to do it. Yeah, I was thinking of um, like anecdotes um, of like uh, Stalin and one of the things that made him like really a tyrant um, besides the laws that he enacted and things like that were people saying they didn't know like what he would be uh, feeling from moment to moment, whether he was feeling like, like killing a town or uh, somehow being benevolent. No, that was actually my last note, was the whole thing about unjust societies. Um, mm-hmm. Ben's not going to make it with us. All right, um, let's move on to uh, the next section. Um, section 11 is two principles of justice. Um, his first principle, um, each person is to have uh, an equal, I paraphrased, uh, each person is to have an equal right um, with the most extensive scheme of equal basic liberties compatible with a similar scheme for others. Um, and he lays out the basic liberties as uh, political liberty and freedom of speech and assembly, liberty of conscience and freedom of thought, freedom of the person, uh, so no psychological oppression, um, free from assault or uh, 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 people taking your personal property and uh, freedom from arbitrary arrest and seizure. Um, the second principle was uh, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both reasonably expected to be for everyone's advantage and attached to positions and offices open to all. Um, that's uh, the positions and offices open to all. That was another um, uh, one of the things that because he talks about how uh, jobs need to be open to all as well and that kind of thing and that um, he really doesn't think that this is going to um, end up in a meritocracy um, which he harps on several times um, which uh, I mean maybe it gets into it in a later chapter but it's I guess I wasn't taking his point about that 
because it seems like uh, it should be open to all, which to me means uh, that um, I guess there are no prereqs for a job. Like, there are no preferred, uh, like there are preferred qualifications, but no required qualifications, I guess. Or there are no, um, like it's an equal, uh, equal employment opportunity type of thing. Um, so I wasn't sure um, how that's so different. But maybe he's just saying it's um, a general principle. Um, then I don't understand how he thinks that doesn't end in a meritocracy. Does he know what the air looks like? Hmm. Um, does he have a Google account? Like the, all that stuff's good? Yeah, um, one thing me and Ben, um, in the latter half that wasn't captured in the video, um, in chapter one, um, we went on sort of extensively was, um, I wasn't sure that, um, so it seems like he lays out a pretty good case that, um, people who, uh, if, if you were a part of this, um, original position and you were thinking about where you could land in the society, um, and you're, you're laying out this system that if you were on the bottom, uh, you would uh, feel like, yeah, this is a good system that I'll go into. If you're on the top, um, same thing. Hey, Brian. Hey, hey. <laughs> nice. Well, welcome. Your duplicate will have a lot of fun. <laughs> have a good one. Um, you know, I lost my train of thought. Thank you, Brian. No, it's good. Um, oh, uh, so uh, people at the bottom will uh, will likely assent to this easily. People at the top will likely assent to this easily. I was trying to think of just people who might not. And one thing I was thinking about is someone who starts off near the bottom of the rung, some, you know, unfortunate, and but through grit and moxie and hard work, sort of works themselves up into a fortunate position. Um, it felt like that person might not feel so great about the distribution. Um, Um, almost those sort of um, libertarian bootstrappy concerns of like, uh, you know, I earned this all, you know, whereas, um, you know, this is sort of justified as uh, people's morally contingent features, um, or um, later on in the book, he's much more explicit about like, you know, you didn't earn the family you uh, went into and um, uh, anything you started with was essentially undeserved. Um, and so 
um, you don't have a huge, uh, you don't have a right to really, uh, it should be any, anything that comes up, comes of that, uh, good position should be passed on. Um, but if you are someone who starts out with little and, er, uh, you know, through your own, uh, efforts does earn all that, um, do you feel that the system is fair at that point? Yeah, he talks about how, um, or at least he sort of implies that if this system was just started, it would probably be super stable. But um, if you had um, uh, landowners and their workers, and then you were applying um, uh, the difference principle, which goes into later on, um, that it might seem weird that a person at such a high level can't get, if he might not want to gain more if it's going to, or, no, what does he say? He has, a, he has an account of why that situation would be weird, that the person in such a high position, um, that we would just think that they should raise like that, um, instead of trying to even them out. posted that. Hopefully they can get in. I didn't put any privacy or anything on this. Yeah, anybody in the world who has access to that group should just be able to hop in. Um, I do like that he says that uh, basic liberties cannot be overridden or infringed upon. Uh, based on increased uh, social or economic advantages. Um, and I think that goes towards um, him not liking the classical utilitarian view. Um, he's essentially like putting constraints on the things that can be changed, um, and for good reason. Mm-hmm. 
Um, Yeah. Yep. Sorry, uh, yeah, Mark's still having trouble with the link. I wonder if it's not, um, if he's doing it on an app and I just need to, like, uh, invite him. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have him uh, message me his um, email, and then I'll invite him directly. Um, the basic liberties can only be limited in so far as they may conflict with each other, which is, um, uh, he, he lays out that top-down hierarchy of, uh, the principles, um, he thinks one is greater than two, and then two breaks down into other principles, which are also lexically ordered, um, and he thinks within each level, um, you can only limit them, uh, <laughs> if they potentially conflict on the same level. Right. Yeah, and he specifically, th uh, he says, uh, injustice is inequalities that are not to the benefit of all. Um, Let's go on to the next section because it's really about that part of it. Um, so the next section is interpret uh, interpretations of the second principle. Um, he says, uh, what should operate is roughly a free market system. And this, I, f I laughed when I kind of read this because I, I don't know how this is compatible with itself, but it's roughly a free market system, but the means of production may or may not be privately owned. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. <clears throat> uh. 
this is where he talks of, um, the next section is where he talks about uh, positions are open to those able and willing to strive for them and uh, uh, th having that available will lead to a just distribution of positions Mm-hmm. Uh, he goes over the principle of efficiency, uh, and, uh, it, <laughs> his math, <laughs> I actually have, one of my notes is the graph, <laughs> uh, but, uh, it's a scheme where you can do better in one way without <laughs> doing worse in another way. Yeah, um, and he, uh, based on this sort of system, like, I'm not sure why that curve should be seen as efficient. Um, I mean, maybe it's just my not knowledge of, like, graph theory or something, but, because um, he goes on to say that, like, uh, a system where it's, like, serfdom is efficient, <laughs> but it's probably not just. <laughs> And just so the viewers know, this is the graph we're talking about. But aren't those, isn't an increase in y, isn't that, isn't the y-axis, isn't that that person's, is that their expectation or is that their actual, so it would seem that if you move, if x is low, y is high in this graph and the opposite, it, and so he's saying at that point that, um, the, uh, uh, B, D, A, right arm, like that's the efficient point. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. 
<laughs> so you can't in, in, you can't exceed this amount of being worse. Sure. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot more sense then. Yeah. Hey there, Mark. Welcome, Mark. We're going over uh, section 12. The principle of efficiency currently. And he sees that as um, uh, the high-income people have already gotten theirs. They've already, you know, uh, they've already started off with more, so they could stand to let the other people get more. go over um, I can't remember if this is a part of the uh, this is like a, a way to excuse me to utilize the principle of efficiency but he has a um, he talks about natural aristocracy um, which is an unregulated unregulated social contingencies but the advantages of those naturally endowed persons is limited to those that further the good of the poorest sectors, which I suppose is what you were talking about there. Um, yep. Yep, and we need to prevent excessive accumulation of property and wealth, uh, have equal opportunities for education, and equal access to cultural knowledge and skills, which I actually, yeah, that's good. I really like that part. Yeah, I was, yeah, <laughs> I was having a taxation is theft <laughs> conversation and I was just trying, and I was just trying to point out like, do you think it's, uh, like, do you think it's moral or good to hoard value that you are stealing from the system uh, and not put it back into the system? And uh, of course the uh, reply was just sort of, well, if that's their prerogative. 
No. Yeah. Uh, one part is, um, I wonder if he thinks that you should view this as going from the original position and out into the real world. Um, and so in that sense, it's fair. Um, Because I, I, I wonder if there's any room for doubt that we should view the the, natu uh, the natural endowments that one is born with as uh, uh, as having received more than other people. Because um, one thing I... I think I might be mis uh, mixing my uh, reading for my ethics class in this book. Um, but that... Uh, oh, no. Uh, it's, uh, it's your desirism episode. Uh, I was uh, thinking that that theory wouldn't, uh, wouldn't necessarily apply well to meeting aliens. And I always try to think any moral system that you come up with, meet something that really isn't you at all. Like... Uh, meet like it you know it's one thing for two countries to meet each other we're all humans uh if we meet another race another sort of creature that uh we um find to be sentient and smart and all these things um uh does it still you know uh, is it just because their desires are different that we should uh sort of roll with it and we're just at in conflict or should we have a moral system that we're like hey guys you know we know we understand your desires are different than our desires but i think we can come to some sort of middle ground where we understand uh what to do with each other Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I... Yeah, um... I really like uh, conversations surrounding um, do our moral, our, our moral, our, some of our moral intuitions because we are the types of creatures we are, and if we are different, if we were different types of creatures, uh, would we feel differently? Um, I was uh, listening to um, a group of moral realists and anti realists sort of hashing it out, you know, the anti realists just sort of like, yeah, but that doesn't hinge on anything. Uh, 
and the realists are like, well, it does hinge on anything. It hinges on the types of creatures we are. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, one of the examples was, um, you can imagine that we are, that if we were differently built, so let's say we had the powers of Wolverine, um, so we instantly healed from any injury, um, and we also didn't feel pain. That's just not something we felt. Everything was either normal, touchy sensation. Yeah, he feels pain, like... Yeah. <laughs> um, but imagine we're that sort of creature. And so uh, is stabbing you a bad thing? Um, you know, we could say that maybe uh, we would consider it uh, maybe rude because uh, you're sort of invading that person's space. Um, but, I mean, maybe it tickled them. Uh, maybe, uh, you, know, st you know, going up and, like, shanking someone in the rib uh, is like a greeting because it just means nothing to that person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> mhm. Mm Good. Uh <laughs> Yeah, I I'm uh after uh having like 3 months of really going at it. Uh I'm, like, utterly burned out from doing it, and now I see uh, a friend of mine who likes to poke our libertarian friend and have the, and sort of goad him into having these sorts of conversations, um, and I'm just like, I'm not in it, I'm not going to engage, because <laughs> I already know what his answers are. Uh... Yeah. I mean, uh, besides, like, any talk of, like, hey, let's uh, curb unnecessary spending, like, yeah, that's not not a liberal principle. Uh, we just think that certain spending is a good thing. And maybe it's a lot of spending. Well, there's a... No. <laughs> but that's the thing. That there's the... I mean, you see the, um, the like, libertarian uh, presidential debates, and you see that there's this wide, wide swing of, like, people who think there should, there should be no government uh, to, like... Um, uh, was it the Bill Welds who are just sort of the, you know, fiscal conservative, socially liberal... Yep. Yeah, I think you had um, 
give an account that the identitarians uh, truly believe that a just system is one where um, uh, positions and things are entirely uh, distributed based on your conting based on your contingent features. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to uh, the next section, 13. Um, and so it went with liberal equality, um, the natural aristocracy, and now uh, he's going to talk about democratic equality because um, I think he doesn't want... Uh, he brings up the principle of efficiency, but he doesn't think that that should be the thing that we follow because um, he thinks the difference principle um, is... Uh, the real go-getter. Um, and so the democratic interpretation of this is fair equality of opportunity and, of course, the difference principle. Um, the social order is not to establish and secure the more attractive prospects of those better off uh, unless doing so is it advantageous to the least fortunate. So um, sort of... Uh, restating that principle that he's trying to find a um a scheme by which he can achieve that uh do, 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 do. it says the graph again oh yeah um <laughs> i had to read this section like four times to really understand what he meant by these graphs um and so we've got this one here which i really did not understand what he meant, but he means that every, uh, this is the sort of equal distribution of, um, of, I guess, rights or goods or whatever, um, and that each one of these lines going out, uh, represent, um, stops along this line where if you were to approach them, it's just, it's a just distribution. Uh, and then, <laughs> I have that written down. <laughs> they are indifferent to how a constant sum of benefits is distributed, and utilitarianism would only be used to break ties. Yeah, he, he seems to take utilitarianism like as that sentence uh, and just that sentence, like without any nuance. That uh, as long as the overall sum is, you know, whatever plane we think it is, uh, we're good. If the difference principle was applied to the relationship between the entrepreneur... Okay, so, uh, yeah, this is the sort of um, uh, landowner uh, working class um, example that he gives. So, if the difference principle was applied to the relationship between the entrepreneurial class and the laborers, anything that would improve the entrepreneur's expectations would encourage them to improve that of the laborers. And that's if you applied the difference principle... So, um, uh, if one goes up, it should also raise the other. Um, and he thinks that, uh, that that should be the way it is. Um,
Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, and he says that um, that this is similar to the Maximin principle, um, but we should not call it that because of uh, that being a specific economic term and that it has features that he doesn't want to apply here. <laughs> I made the note, uh, it seems like if trickle-down was forced to work. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the hope of that, <laughs> the hope that trickle down works. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, he says that justice is prior to efficiency, which I think is uh, going back to his um, uh, hierarchy of the principles. Justice is prior to efficiency and may require changes that are not efficient. Um, so if we ever found out that uh, some set of circumstances uh, needed to be changed at a institutional level, um, it wouldn't matter if it was like a waste in some sense. Yeah. Uh, let's see, let's see. The difference principle doesn't attend to the initial positions, only to the subsequent variations in the positions. Um, and I think that's, uh, that was what I was talking about, how he thinks they shouldn't, uh, the difference principle all on its own doesn't, it doesn't seek to level um, the positions. It only says that if one goes up, it sh the other should also go up. Um, and that's when he wants the, uh, the, the, uh, idea of the sort of baseline, I guess, to apply. Yep. And then he, t yeah. And then he talks about chain connection, um, where he assumes that um, if you have a spectrum of people from the least advantage to the high, highest advantage, that if you were to raise one, you would raise all in the chain. Um, I wrote, assuming that changing one changes all, but not necessarily uh, together at the same rate. Um, so if the high guy goes up, middle guy middlingly goes up, and bottom guy goes up a lot. And in light of this, he uh, he restates his section, second principle. Um, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both... Huh. Is that, is that different? I don't know. Uh, the greatest expected benefit of the least advantaged and attached to offices and positions. Uh, so he goes um, back and forth when he's talking whether or not he's saying actual benefit or expected benefit. Um, yeah. Mm hmm
Right. I started uh, taking him to mean almost like promised, but yeah, I don't know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. In the same way. Yeah. Uh, this last portion is where he talks about... Um, uh, an, an economist might want to think of the difference principle as the maximin, but that it's not the maximin. Uh, because maximin is mostly understood as a rule of choice under great uncertainty, whereas he thinks the difference principle is one of justice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he doesn't want to suggest that... Um, this principle coming from the original position uh, comes from an assumption of very high risk aversion, of being very conservative about it. Yeah. I, th I think if you're going to set up this thought experiment where no one knows what they're going to be, but they're going to set out a system that, yeah, you kind of have to have those. Um, you need to, uh, yeah, as you said, you have to sort of uh, look at the spectrum of what one could become in the, into the world, um, and you have to sort of... Uh, you know, bet on all the squares, I mean, and uh, where, you know, uh, you got to put more chips down on the lower rung in case people, um, <laughs> in case you end up there. Uh, otherwise, people are not going to drop into a world where they might be on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised he doesn't... Or maybe he does and I missed it, but I'm surprised that I don't come away thinking that um, the way that he convinces uh, people who are thinking about coming in at a higher rung... Um, that it's, like, noble to help the lower tier, um, that he doesn't try to give them, yeah, that he doesn't try to give them other more social or psychological currency to hedge on that side. Hmm. Let's move on to fair equality of opportunity and pure procedural justice. Um, this is where I came away with thinking, because uh, I wrote here, not about being meritocratic. Um, so it must be early on that he says it. Um, In particular, I shall try to show further on that this principle is not subject to the objection that it leads to a meritocratic society. I'm not, yeah, so I'm not sure if he means this in general, like this particular thing, or the entire system that he's setting up. 73, right at the beginning of section 14, the first paragraph. Maybe, yeah, so he's saying it's a fair quality of opportunity is not the same as his careers open to talents.
right? Right. So when he says like access to position or careers open to talents, um, is he saying he's not restricted to who can interview for a position or is he saying we will wait who we choose to the for those positions um, less towards people who are like superstars for it? Yeah, so I'm wondering if his, the objection that it leads to a meritocratic society is he's trying to make sure that you don't think this leads to that, um, that he will be applying affirmative action or something a la that. Um, yeah. Um, I wonder, I don't know if I missed it, but I wonder if he gets to that in this chapter, because I don't think he gets to that in this section of um how he alleviates that but it does say further on in 17 but i mean i read through 17. <laughs> Yeah. So he's saying no restricting access to positions, even if doing so would produce good results. Um, excuse me. Restricting access, excuse me, would limit those barred from certain forms of human good. Um, which I think is the whole, um, like, um, Sometimes it seems like he's applying the principle to the current world and not the world he's intending to create via the, the um, via the book, because um, uh, I take uh, would limit those barred from certain forms of moral uh, certain forms of human good to mean that um, there are people of the, in the lower classes who do not have access to. Um, certain cultural knowledge, certain education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in this system that he's creating, they do have that. Um, but I guess he may mean that uh, uh, just the things that a lower-tiered person might have access to simply by dint of being lower-tiered that um, we want to correct for that, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think you're right. Hmm. Yeah, you said he, when he talks about imperfect procedural justice, he actually says that it's probably impossible to realize perfect procedural justice. Um, and then he has that, he has a discussion of imperfect, <laughs> that it's uh, essentially a, uh, the current state of like criminal trials are imperfect procedural justice um, because the innocent can be found guilty and the guilty can be found innocent. Um, Da, 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 da. And we speak of them as miscarriages of justice, but they do not spring forth from human fault, but just a combination of circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Um, then he starts getting... Um, uh, uh, up against another utilitarian uh, section where he wants to rail on them, um, but before he just before he does that, he I think he argues for a uh, like because he's always like, oh, we really want a free market, but where production is regulated, like the amount of things that we make is regulated. So it always seems that he's saying, hey, yeah, we definitely want this free market, um, but it might be communist. <laughs> but I don't think he's talking about the regulation of the financial aspects of it. He seems to be talking about the specific production of goods and the distribution of those goods. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. So if we so if we take like the steel industry example, um, there's a bunch of companies making steel, but we have this cap where we say you know uh, only you can only produce up to X amount of steel. Um, it can be a free market if um, it's still um, you know they can let's say all the companies can make up to that point um, as a matter of their business. But the free market part of it was like, is like, who can do it more efficiently and sell their product more competitively? Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And then he talks about, um, I don't know how to say this word properly, allocative. I know it means allo it's allocate, allocative, I guess. Yeah, but there's no... <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, I think it's allo allocative. Okay. Uh, top of 77. By contrast, al allocative justice. Um, so he thinks that is utilitarianism, and it wouldn't care about procedural justice because institutions are imperfect arrangements to dis are basically just imperfect arrangements to distribute satisfaction. Um, yeah. 
Mm. Um, then he goes on to talk about uh, the importance of these prints. Uh, so again, um, he spends a lot of time in this chapter talking about um, the hierarchy of the principles and how they are to be ordered and how they're to be followed. Um, which I think is important, and I actually do appreciate that he goes over it several times every time he introduces a new part. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's good. All right, uh, so the next section is primary social goods as the basis of expectation. Uh, <laughs> my first note is util utilitarianism is bad and you should feel bad. Because <laughs> um, he goes on, uh, he sings... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, specifically classical. Yeah, I wonder, because this is the uh, revised edition of this, um, but he came out with an even more revised edition. Like, there's a one after even this, I think, that he came out with. Um, or uh, maybe it's like an addendum, like it's a smaller book or something like that. It's like a discussion of what's gone on since the release of the book. Um which I'd be interested in reading that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not so hard on the utilitarians anymore. Yeah. Almost every section has a, and this is why it's, you know, we don't want utilitarianism in this case. Yeah, he goes <laughs> he goes on to say that uh, utilitarianism <clears throat> assumes that it has a fairly accurate measure of util of utility and that you have a cardinal measure for each representative individual and you have a method of correlating the scales of different persons and that the gains of some are t and that you have a way of uh, telling how the gains of some outweigh the losses of others. Yes. Uh, do, 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 do. The difference principle just needs. Oh, okay. So the difference principle just needs the least advantaged person. Uh, okay. So he's he's trying to say um, how you can tell uh, how the difference principle is applying 
So he's trying to compare it to utilitarianism. He's saying they have no way of making this comparison. Um, and he's saying the difference principle just needs the least advantaged person and their and a sense of their well-being. And then that is your basis for comparison because basically you're just monitoring that least person and seeing if they go up when you make any other change. Right. Yeah, I'm actually really excited in my ethics class. Um, we're going to be reading Marx and also, or uh, well, we're, uh, Marx is on the um, the official, yes, we're going to read this syllabus, um, but he also had some extra readings, and one was the second treatise on government. Um, and uh, I think I'm gonna just going to download the audio book and listen to it like four times. Um, but I also think I'm going to add Leviathan to that, because I think that's an important... Um, a th important thing to read along with Locke. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. Good, yeah. Would you say, um, putting aside the difficulty of reading the material itself, uh, would you say that a good progression of reading these sorts of things would be, um, so Hobbes and Locke, and then probably Rawl or uh, probably Rawls next, and then Nozick after that, just for cap some kind of capstone. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um... I had... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I actually want to read, like, uh, Nagarjuna, uh, the Mahayana Buddhism stuff. Um, uh, there's, um, <laughs> I wrote this, it just, I think it's just bad wording, but I just wanted to know if you thought it was bad wording. In the middle of page 79, um, in a sentence that starts, 
in the middle of the second paragraph, right in the middle, it says, Now primary goods, as I have already remarked, are things which it is, which it is supposed a rational man wants whatever else he wants. What does the la what is the last part of that sentence? I kind of know what he's saying. Okay. Okay. Okay, that makes more sense. That's interesting. No, I didn't. Um, um, so he says, uh, in regards to the primary social goods, um, that these are rights, liberties, opportunities, income, and wealth, and that, uh, in general, the more primary social goods means you would have greater success in carrying out your intentions. Um, so it's here that he starts laying out, like, um, I like uh, your phrasing of it, um, when you say that you have projects of worth um, and projects that are important to you. I like talking about it as projects and less as intentions or um, your plan, something like that. Um, and I think he's laying, uh, he takes um, this section and also, um, uh, I think later section also, about how uh, essentially the system we are setting up should be one where um, the, the institutional system should be there to help you further your projects um, and not hinder your projects. Um, and he doesn't think that the distribution from high to low affects the high very much, or at least not in an immoral or unjust way, that they can still carry on their projects, but that we are shifting that to the low-tier people um, so that they can carry on what projects they feel are worthy. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, because um, if you, <clears throat> um, like, I don't think it would be hard to explain to conservatives or libertarians that if you have more people better trained and better educated, that that would not raise um, the project of the country up. Um, and that why you would want to let there be more people languishing in uh, in the lower tier, <laughs> why it would not seem good for everyone that we do lift those people up.
right? Yeah, that was something. Uh, <laughs> right. Yep. Um, yeah, exactly. And I think it's also something to be said about being in a culture that is enriched and smart. Like, is that not also better? Like, do you want to be walled off with the few that have that state? Or do you want to be in the open garden of a huge population who are all interesting and culturally uh, informed and smart and skilled and... <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. And I wonder, is that itself a contingent feature, that way of being? Do you think there's people slanted toward that heavily through psychology or their genetics? Sure, yeah. He doesn't like saying what things are good or right um, and not in relation to other things. And so in this section, he says, uh, what is good is the satisfaction of rational desire. And I think that's probably about right. At least uh, for what he's talking about. Going back to how the difference principle needs the least advantaged person, their well-being, he also says that it would be easy to find out who the least favored person is. He thinks that's uh, not a hard thing to do, which, yeah, probably. And then he also talks about, because uh, in, in these things he always talks about a particular representative person um, but here's where uh, here and I think in the next section is where he also starts talking about representative groups um, which he just switches off doing it mm-hmm 
Um, this is one sentence I actually really like here. Uh, it says, men share in primary goods on the principle that some can have more if they are acquired in wage which improve the situation of the least favored. Um, I really liked that, um, the way he stated that. Um, and that also made me wonder about um, what I wondered about earlier, where is he going to um, increase the social currency of being in the higher tier of saying that it's like a noble thing to pass that value down? Oh no, I'm wondering, so there's like, like yeah, like I give to charity, I work with uh, several organizations to do charitable work and I like doing it and I uh, don't like trumpet it out like, hey guys, here's what I did uh, for the social currency of that. But I'm wondering if he thinks at some point that in the original position you might want to put a little bit of that into the system to convince the people who might otherwise want that sort of stuff. Right, but you're assessing the, the spectrum of people you could become. Um, so if you're, if I always think of it like I'm looking at like a deck of uh, like trading cards. It's like, oh, I could be this person uh, right here. Oh, my uh, my humility is low, and my <laughs> my um, charitability is also low. Like, <laughs> what? Or but my uh, narcissism is high. Ooh, what about this person? <laughs> right. Oh, so in the so the in the original position you are you're a rational actor, but what you uh, you're uh, the things you're limited to knowing about the next world are just those. Here's what everybody should want. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, the next chapter is the original position, okay. <laughs> seeing that <laughs> right all right well <laughs> let's move on to relevant social positions which is the next section um, this is where he brings up equal citizenship which is uh, he says like from a from the standpoint of the institution that is the general starting point that everyone would be at um, and so um, when you're going out for an office or position within those institutions, um, your position in society 
whatever the hierarchy, social hierarchy there may be, um, shouldn't matter. Um, but he also says social structure is to regulate the natural inequalities in the benefits of social cooperation, which I think social cooperation is the government institutions, those sorts of constructions. Uh, he says there are three contingencies to use to determine who the least advantaged are. Excuse me. Uh, family and class origins, their natural endowments, and also the fortune and luck that has, or uh, in this case, misfortune and bad luck that has uh, gone on in a person's life. Um, whether or not uh, uh, even in equal situation, even in uh, sort of equal starting points, whether or not just the cards have not fallen well for that person. Uh, over and over, yes. I was, uh, I was uh, in my ethics class. Uh, we were talking about um, we're going through the Socratic dialogues. Um, so we're going through Euthyphro, Apology, uh, Credo, and Phaedo. And, um, yeah. And um, I was interested to learn that uh, Republic was written after those ones. And that Republic is more uh, Plato playing Socrates as the puppet. Uh, and that these, these are the ones that are most likely Socrates actually... These are actual Socrates things. Um... But uh, I brought up moral luck, and he questioned what is moral luck. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> and I was like, I, I think I gave a pretty good account of it. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, he said moral luck in an inquisitive tone. And so I just went on to explain moral luck for the class. <laughs> But studies have shown that uh, they didn't care about uh, fidelity. Although he may have, because of being who he was and who his teacher was, he may have thought fidelity was a good thing. <laughs> yeah i was um uh because uh, i so i read the the dialogues um and then i like um took in the yale course uh lectures on the dialogues and then i uh looked up other people's discussions of them um and uh i was interested to hear that in political philosophy those are seen as like big um free speech uh, argument things that the case against Socrates was like is like a big like oh you should be you know this is a society who didn't care about uh, just letting the man speak <laughs> found that I need to be more of an empty cup at in class uh, <laughs> I need to let the class be the class and not uh, outpace it like attempt to outpace it 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is hard. Because uh, we get into these things and people who uh, I think make really good points but ha uh, haven't read a lot. Um, they give these long speeches of, uh, well, what about this thing in society? And what about uh, hurt people hurt people? And what about that? And that's actually <laughs> when my moral luck thing came up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, uh, we have to write a paper about some things, and I essentially, I, st I started uh, just jotting down my notes about it, and it just became a speech that I wanted to give in class, <laughs> but I was like, I can't do that. That's a no. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. I broke it into, just took two pieces of it and threw those out there, but otherwise, <laughs> let the class be the class. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I can't find the area, but I wrote down <laughs> free market but distributed wealth. Uh, for this section on relevant social positions, because he seemed to think that, which again, is that a free market? Like, why is why are why is there market competition if we're just giving out money? <laughs> No one should benefit from natural contingencies, save where it benefits others. Right, yes. All right. That's actually I mean these last sections are all are all like this was almost like two pages long. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. So the next section, the tendency to equality. Uh uh he points out that the difference principle is not the principle of redress, um although it does include some of its intents or in achieve some of its intents. Um so he doesn't think that this is, <laughs> he doesn't want the difference principle to be seen as uh, almost like punishing the higher tier for being higher tier, I think. Um, but he does <laughs> constantly iterate that um, natural endowments and inequalities of your birth are not deserved by you. Um, Yeah, that's what I felt at this whole section. So, 
So natural distribution of endowments is neither just or unjust, but what is just or unjust is how the institutions deal with those facts. Yeah, and uh, I wrote... I wrote here, uh, he makes a strong anti-libertarian claim. Uh, ones with greater advantages should view that as their compensation in the face of benefits going to the least advantage. Mm-hmm. One, <laughs> zero, or two? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he says uh, the family is a natural expression of the difference principle, that basically we are already doing this in the case of your young and family that uh, we almost expect people who are um, doing well to help their least uh, advantaged family. I think it could mean children, but I think it also means like, uh, if you have like uh, a, almost like the prodigal son type of situation where like he's a shit bird, but throw him a couple ducats. So I just watched uh, the uh, Black Panther again, and um, at the end when he's, uh, I think he's in front of like the UN or something, um, and he goes, you know, we should view everyone as our tribe. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, <laughs> there's good tribalism. Everyone's in the tribe. <laughs> I love, uh, do you know, do you listen to the, uh, I mean, you're super busy, but the Angry Black Rant podcast? Okay, yeah, um, they had the whole, the, when that movie came out, they had a whole, like, we love this movie podcast, uh, but a big section of it was like, yeah, we're down with Killmonger for the most part. <laughs> what motivates him but not what he wants to do with it uh, Nakia mm-hmm yeah correct right <laughs> it's team Nakia people right <laughs> right <laughs> Just like, I just want her to like be in that throne room where he's like, uh, no, we're going to help the world by killing all the other people. <laughs> right. biggest pet peeves about plots in some movies is when you're just like all you had to do was say one thing at that one point and all the rest of this movie doesn't happen yes of course yes No, of course. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, there wasn't much else in this section that I really had comment on. I just, I, I noted that any scheme to regulate natural endowment should be consensual. Um, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> there are several points in this. <laughs> Good. Uh, there are several points at the end of this chapter where I'm like, he is one word from saying uh, Harrison Bergeron should go. <laughs> um, which clearly he wouldn't, but like... <laughs> uh, so in Harrison Bergeron, they want... Um, natural endowments are the bad thing. And instead of shifting... Uh, any value gained from those natural endowments down to those who have less endowments. We're actually just going to grab their high bar and pull it down. Um, and so that everyone is uh, at, you know, whatever level we choose. <laughs> and, um... Right, and so, sometimes that's why, uh, well, when he's talking about, like, how we should redistribute, and he's talking about the higher tier, and just like, guys, you have a lot, just let us take it. Uh, that's why I'm always harping on, like, is he going to give them something else? Like, <laughs> is he going to justly compensate them, except for saying, hey, it's the right thing to do? They are already compensated. Right. <laughs> yeah. You don't need a bigger yacht. We have starving people. <laughs> right. All right, uh, so next is principles for individuals, the principle of fairness. This is where he gets into, um, I like that he, um, in principles for individuals, he sets out that there should be institutional principles and then individual principles. And that, um, so people who want to uh, have, who specifically want to have uh, positions within the institution have a certain set of duties and obligations and then just the people on the ground have uh, sort of a base set of obligations and duties um, da, 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 da. and he says the institutional principles are uh, this is where uh, just more of the, um, the uh, institutional principles are hierarchically greater than the individual principles um, <laughs> this is where he said, we are not to gain from the cooperative labors of others without uh, doing our fair share. Which, uh, I know he wrote this in like the 50s or the 40s or something. We should take the phrase fair share out of our discourse from a marketing standpoint. Because, um, man, people who don't like liberal principles hate the phrase fair share. Um, uh Um, no, because uh, what is 20% to a poor person is not the same as what is 20% to a rich person. Um, and so they think that like, oh, well, I've just paid like, you know, $50,000 in taxes. Uh, isn't that enough of my share? That kind of thinking. Yeah, I can't remember if it was uh, you or Thomas, but um, one of you said uh, 
yeah, it's great that you think that like this scheme of doing things uh, will is like a slippery slope. But can we just take the first step and see how that goes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's fine. Uh, he's too busy. Uh, yeah. Um, I wrote that there's no obligation to just institutions. I don't know what that was in reference to. This is where he starts talking about... Oh, so it's a person's obligation... Oh, 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 okay. Sorry, I, no, I wrote the... I, di I didn't write it correctly. You have no obligation to an unjust uh, institution. Um, this is where he's... Yeah. Um, he's saying that uh, any system that is, like, tyrannical or, art or autocratic or arbitrary, you have no obligation to it because it essentially doesn't have an obligation to you. Um, and any obligations are covered by the principle of fairness. Um, and so, yeah, just like any, any system that's not taking you into account, you shouldn't take it into account. Yeah. Um, he says fiduciary, oh, okay, so fiduciary obligation will be explained elsewhere way longer in the books. It says sections 51 and 52. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> All right. And that's the end of that. That was a pretty short section. Uh, so that was principles of for individuals as they uh, pertain to the principle of fairness. And then here's where he lays out what he thinks are the natural duties. Um, and so these are what you are what he thinks everyone should be obligated towards without having to tell them that they are obligated toward them. Um, so helping others who are in jeopardy, provided it doesn't have excessive risk or loss to you, um, that you have a duty not to harm or injure others, and that you have a duty not to cause unnecessary suffering. But he says, you have no previous commitment to do these things. They are just equally held by all persons and because other people are doing them, you should do them. And because you're, should doing, you're doing them, other people should do them, essentially. Like, we should all think that these are the things that we should be doing. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> uh, he says... Uh, <laughs> When we add it all up, no, uh, Um, he says that the more privileged likely acquire obligations tying them strongly to a just scheme. So essentially, the more you're getting out of the society, the more you are obligated to justly participate in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think this is more like 
hey, you could be a, you could get dropped into the lowest tier, but look what happens to the high tier. <laughs> it just feels like more of that. Uh, oh, uh, so there's this this hierarchy of all the different principles and concepts that uh, um, this is how he puts it that like from I think it's left to right and then up to down is how the hierarchy of these things should play out and um, there's a section of individuals and their permissions and he's going to go on permissions later on in the book um, where you should be indifferent to them or whether or not they're super auditory. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's literally just, uh, I think just graphically representing what he's saying. Um, but he talks about super auditory actions and that we might think that these are good to do, but you are under no obligation to do them. And uh, that made me think that, like, um, in our current society, I think we so uh, put stock in super uh actions that we are thinking that they're not super That, like, um, <laughs> if a dad didn't throw himself in front of the bus that's about to hit his child we would think him some sort of moral monster. <laughs> yeah. Right, yep. Well, I think it's it it's almost like the trolley problem thing. I think people have intuitions that they are morally obligatory, even though if we sat down and sketched them out that they're not. But I think that goes into the... Um, um, when Sam Harris talked to... Uh, not Pinker. The guy who says that, like, you shouldn't treat your family like you treat or you yeah you shouldn't treat your fan you should treat society like you treat your family um you should feel morally obligated to everyone um uh it's it's sort of that kind of thing like <laughs> uh we feel very strongly that you should do this even though you might not I think you are correct on that. I think, and uh, the reason I say I think current society is that is because I feel the pull of it. And um, I almost feel that those super auditory actions are, I almost feel like I demand them of myself, almost. Like if there was a bus careening toward a stranger, I might uh, be so pushed to knock them out of the way. But whether or not in the moment I could literally <laughs> push myself to do it is quite another. Mm-hmm. Sure. 
and it's Yeah. And uh, he says classical utilitarians can't account for that, and they must turn the track to themselves <laughs> regardless. Okay, good. All right. Um, and with that, uh, we've reached the end of chapter two. <laughs> two hours seems to be the length for each chapter, um, although these chapters have been of similar size. Quillette is the, um, I've heard a lot of people say Quillette <laughs> in the past, like, two weeks. Is that the, uh, it's, like, written by some alt-right woman who doesn't want it to be alt-right or something? <laughs> just one calorie, not even enough. We just watched that movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this was really good. Felt good. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else uh, you wanted to add about the two principles? Good, good. <laughs> and misogynist, good, good. Good. All right, I'm gonna stop the stream here.